All right, in this video, let's discuss the microbiology associated with the urogenital tract. <clears throat> so as with all the other organ systems, we'll think about the basic anatomy. We'll think about the defenses we find in this organ system to help protect it from infection. And then we'll think about the uh, normal microorganisms that we find inhabiting that organ system. So as always, let's begin with <clears throat> anatomy. So the genitourinary tract is kind of two major components linked together. So we've got the urinary tract and the genital system or the reproductive tract. So um, let's start with the urinary tract and think about the major structures that we include there. So the urinary tract is going to include the kidneys. Um, we'll have the ureters that connect the kidneys to the bladder. So we've got the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, and the urethra, which will carry urine from the bladder out of the body. Now, these are the major structures. Of course, there's all sorts of other accessory structures. And if you looked closely at the kidneys, um, we could think about the structure of nephrons and how they filter blood. Um, but this, for us, we really need to understand this sort of gross anatomy at the highest level. So that's the urinary tract, pretty simple. And compared to the genital systems, the urinary tract is the same in males and females. So the other half of the genitourinary tract is the genital system, again, the reproductive system. And so these organ systems are quite different in males and females. So we'll begin with the male genital system. Um, here we'll add structures, structures like the testes, uh, the vas deferens, um, and really that's it for the male reproductive tract. It's pretty simple. The thing I want to point out about the male reproductive tract is that it, there is a lot of overlap between the male reproductive tract and the urinary tract. So here in the diagram, we can see the testes connect through the vas deferens to the urethra just after the urethra exits the bladder. So uh, the rest of the urinary tract is the urethra, or the rest of the genital tract is the urethra, right? And so again, a lot of overlap between the urinary tract and the genital tract. They share structures in common. And that'll be important as we discuss the defenses of the male genital system and the microbes that inhabit the male genital system. So now let's think about the female genital system. So here uh, for the female, we're going to pay attention to the major structures again, the vagina, the cervix, the uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovaries. So females have a more complex genital system, um, a few more structures to keep track of, but a gener generally, if we progress from the outside in, right, the vagina through the cervix to the uterus, and then fallopian tubes connect the ovaries to the uterus. Again, there's all sorts of other uh, structures, but we're just paying attention to sort of the gross anatomy at this point. Um, the other detail here is that uh, unlike the male genital system, the female genital system does not overlap or share any structures in common with the urinary tract. So the vagina and the urethra are separate, right? These two tracts, these two uh, organ systems do not overlap. So that's the basic um, anatomy, right? Some straightforward structures that we need to keep track of. How do we defend these organ systems or this organ system from microbial infection? So let's uh, think about each of the structures or each component one at a time. We'll start with the urinary tract. So we'll define defenses of the urinary tract, then we'll look at defenses of the genital system and think about how they are the same and different. So the urinary tract. One of the main defenses our urinary tract has against infection is that several times a day, this urinary tract is flushed with urine, right? So there's a strong stream of fluid through the urethra specifically, um, but there's also a constant flow of fluid from the kidneys to the bladder and then from the bladder out the urethra. Um, this flow of urine makes it extraordinarily hard for microbes to adhere in this environment. So anything that infects the urinary tract has to have an extraordinarily 
strong adhesive mechanism so that it can stay put in the urinary tract. So we've got the flushing action of urine. In addition, if a cell adheres to the urinary tract, let's say a pathogen has found its way into the urethra and it's sort of grabbed hold, the epithelial cells in the urethra shed from time to time. So if a pathogen sticks to a cell, well, that cell might just fall off and flush out with the urine, and that will take the pathogen with it. So again, this just highlights how important it, um, adherence mechanisms are to pathogens that are going to infect the urinary tract. All right, what else? So urine itself contributes to the chemical defenses of the urinary tract. So urine is slightly acidic. Um, we know that not all microbes can survive in an acidic environment. So only acidophiles will be able to thrive here. And that helps limit the number of organisms that can be potential pathogens in the urinary tract. Uh, we've got other proteins that are antibacterial um, that are uh, found in the urine. So we've heard of at least one of these before, and let's talk about a second one. So examples might include proteins like lysozyme. We've talked about lysozyme many times in our course. Again, lysozyme weakens bacterial cell walls, specifically because lysozyme breaks the glycosidic bonds in those cell wall structures. Um, but let's think about lactoferrin. So lactoferrin is a chemical that will um, sequester iron. So ferrin here refers to iron. And so lactoferrin sort of soaks up all the available iron. Um, this might be familiar when we talked about fever. So one of the beneficial effects of fever is that it caused the amount of available micronutrients, like iron, to decrease. And this limited the ability of microbes to grow in that environment. Lactoferrin soaks up the available iron, and that starves any microbes of that iron that they need to grow. So in the presence of lactoferrin, they won't be able to grow as much. So that's a way that we can protect our urinary tract from infection. Uh, our urinary tract also has secretory antibodies. So we're secreting antibodies into there to hopefully detect the antigens of potential pathogens early so that we can inactivate or destroy them. All right, so those are the defenses of the urinary tract. How about defenses of the genital tract, the genital system? So here we'll have to separate males and females. We'll, uh, we'll address males first and females second. So for the male reproductive system, remember that the reproductive tract overlaps heavily with the urinary tract. So for males, the defenses of the reproductive tract, the genital system, are pretty much identical, are identical, to the defenses of the urinary tract. So primarily the flushing action of urine, but again, the fact that epithelial cells um, shed, we've got these chemical defenses of urine, the pH, the, um, the proteins like lysozyme and lactoferrin, and the antibodies. All right, so the male genitourinary defenses are pretty straightforward. In the female, things are a little bit more complex. So again, because the reproductive tract is separate from the urinary tract, we need a completely separate set of defenses. So these defenses also change over time, which is additionally complicated. So females go through um, maturation, right, at puberty, and then again later in life during uh, menopause. And both of these events in female development, puberty and menopause, lead to changes in the defenses of the reproductive system. So when we think about the defenses, we need to think about them at certain times in a female's life. So we'll break the defenses down into the defenses that we observe during the non-reproductive years, during the reproductive years, and then um, we'll think about the post-reproductive years as well. So non-reproductive would be pre-puberty um, and post-menopause, whereas reproductive is after puberty, but before menopause. 
right? So non-reproductive, before puberty, um, after menopause. There, the female reproductive system is primarily protected um, from mucus or with mucus and a large proportion of secretory antibodies. So we've talked about the benefits of mucus during the in our discussion of the respiratory tract. Um, these should trap potential pathogens and they can help us flush pathogens from the organ system. But how about during the reproductive years? So we've still got the mucus with the secretory antibodies, but we've got additional changes. During the reproductive years, the female genitourinary, the female reproductive system is, has generally a low pH, it's acidic. And specifically, this acidic environment is associated with the vagina. So why does this happen? So during puberty, the female body begins to produce higher levels of estrogen. And this stimulates vaginal cells to secrete glycogen. Glycogen is just a, uh, a glucose compound. So it's many, many glucose molecules together. So at puberty, the vaginal cells begin to secrete sugar. Then in the vaginal environment, certain bacteria ferment those sugars. We know that fermentation produces a waste product of acid, lactic acid often. And so this creates a reduced pH. Specifically, these bacteria are the lactobacilli that we've talked about in the past. And this environment is maintained throughout the reproductive years for females. From puberty to menopause, those cells are constantly secreting glycogen, which again is just glucose. The bacteria that are normal inhabitants of the vagina uh, ferment that sugar, creating acid. And that acid is protective because it creates an acidic environment and now only acidophiles will be able to grow in the vagina. At menopause, secretion of glycogen stops and the pH returns to neutral. And we rely again at only on the, the mucus and the secretory antibodies for protection at that point. All right, so what are the normal biota that inhabit the genitourinary tract. So again, let's think about it one part at a time and in males and females. So first, the urinary tract in males and females, pretty much the same. The only place we find microbes in the urinary tract are the outer regions of the urethra, so closest to the skin. Um, the bacteria that we find in those outermost regions of the urethra are really identical to the microbes that we find on the skin. And so here are a few examples. Farther up the urinary tract should be sterile. So the bladder should be free of microbes. The kidneys should be free of microbes. So everything else in the urinary tract is sterile. So that's true in both males and females. The outermost part of the urethra has some skin microbes. The rest is sterile. How about the reproductive system? So in males, the reproductive system, again, overlaps with the urinary system. So the population there is exactly the same. The outermost region of the urethra has some skin microbes, but the vas deferens and the testes should be sterile. No microbes in those areas. The female reproductive tract, now it's separate. So it has a different um, environment and a different population of microbes. We do find microbes living there. Uh, the microbes in the female reproductive tract should be limited to the vagina. Everything from the cervix up, so the uterus and the ovaries and the fallopian tubes, should be sterile. The microbes that we um, find in the vagina change over time. During the non-reproductive years, when the pH is more neutral, we generally find the same kinds of microbes that we do in the urinary tract, skin microbes. But during the reproductive years, we find a high percentage of these lactobacilli, lactobacillus species, which are creating the acid, um, maintaining that acidic environment. We will also find a very small population of things like candida albicans. Candida albicans is a yeast. And previously in our class, we've talked about how if lactobacillus go away, candida albicans can overgrow, leading to yeast infections. Again, they are a normal inhabitant of the vagina, just in low populations. So we'll end there. As always, please let me know if you have any questions, and I look forward to talking to you all again very soon.